But the gospel is as important to your walk with Christ as your daily prayer and your daily reading of the scripture. For the word. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> my son and my granddaughter, my granddaughter, I'm sure he's going to hate what I said. My son and my grandson were with me um, last night as I was writing this, and um, we were watching some TV programs, so um, this was kind of patched together, but it was still informed. I'm going to try to pay attention to what I'm doing right now. Four, eight. 12, 16, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40. You know what that was? What I was doing was counting the amount of people that died right now and didn't know Jesus. In 10 seconds, every 10 seconds, 40 people die and never get to know Jesus. Let's count them a little bit more. 44, 48, 52, 56, 60. I did a research uh, over the last four or five days, and I found out that every year in the world, 151,600 people die in the world every day. That comes to about 6,300 people that die every hour. 105 people die every minute. That's nearly two people that die every second. And that gives us a total of 55,000, of 55.3 million people that die each year. We live in a world with 7.6 billion people. 2.5 billion, where 35% of them are said to be Christians. And what that means, only one, out of every people that die had their sins forgiven. Only one out of every person that dies is saved from eternal damnation. Only one out of every person that dies knows Jesus. In the United States, there are 357 million people. 167 of them 167 million claim to be Christians. So that's one out of every two people that die in the United States die and never know Jesus. At first, that doesn't look that bad except the fact that in the United States, 70% of all Christians live in 13 of the southern states. The other 37 36 states, 37, 37 states <laughs> um, make up only 30% of the Christians. Let me bring this a little closer to home for y'all. In Pennsylvania, 99,565 people died last year. That's all diseases, that's gunshots, that's whatever the case that may be. That comes to about one death every 24 to 26 seconds in Pennsylvania. <coughs> now, I wasn't able to find the, the numbers in Philadelphia. I think the city of Philadelphia is trying to hide those numbers for us. But I did find out in Philadelphia, we have something unique in that more churches are being torn down in Philadelphia than any other city. They actually have a list that you can go on Google and find. It's called the 20 historic churches most likely to be torn down. And these aren't just new churches. These are churches, some of them with 100 and 200 plus years of being established. And the reason these churches are failing is because they are not replenishing themselves. They're not evangelizing. We can make this as difficult as we want, but to make it simple, those churches that evangelize survive. Those that don't, die.
And to small churches, there aren't even any records of. Churches with less than 150, 200 people, nobody even knows what their failure rate is. I seen a, a pastor Tuesday from Philadelphia on YouTube going through the city and marking churches that were being torn down and churches that had been not well taken care of. The, 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 the uh, roofs were leaking, windows were knocked out, doors weren't working. And this seems to be the acceptable behavior from Christians of the condition that we're in. But what we need to know that we must evangelize. Evangelize not just because it's something that we're asked to do by the leaders of the church, but because this is how God assures that his body remains. I know a lot of you are saying that, well, I don't know how to give the gospel. I don't know how. And here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I did this morning. I decided to include the gospel in your um, daily bulletin. And I'm going to read it for you. You don't have to read it with me. Just know it's there. What you can do if you want to you want to tell people about Jesus. This is real simple. You tell them about what Jesus has done in your life. And if you don't remember the gospel, you just stand with man. It's real simple. Make some copies hand it to them. The gospel said, now, so that we understand, every time we preach, we must be preaching the gospel. It's good to preach what God has done to you, what God has done for you. But the main purpose is the gospel. The Bible says, Paul says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So if we're not giving them the gospel, you know, it's good to tell them Jesus loves you, but you have to tell them how they need to deal with that knowledge. Let me give you the gospel. The gospel says that the one and only holy God made us in his own image so that we would have a personal relationship with him. But we sin that our sin cut us off from him and set us up for eternal damnation. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is eternal death. And this puts us in a place where none of us could pay the cost of our own sin. So eternal death was our right and just punishment. But God in his great love for us sent his son Jesus Christ to rescue us from our eternal fate. And Jesus lived a perfect life and thus died an innocent death on the cross as a substitute sacrifice for our sins. Thereby, thereby fulfilling the law in himself, he took the punishment that we rightly deserved. Then on the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead, showing that God the Father had accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And the wrath of God towards each one of us had been exhausted. And all you need to do for eternal life is you must repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. That's how simple the gospel is. And I know y'all can't remember that, but it's written down. <laughs> so you don't even have to tell, you just tell them about Jesus and say, and by the way, here you go. See how easy I made that? The gospel In Romans uh, 1.16, it says the that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The point I want you to understand is that there is an urgency to evangelize. We have taken evangelism to mean something we do every now and then. You know, I spoke to someone about Jesus uh, last um, Thursday, I think it was. But the gospel is as important to your walk with Christ as your daily prayer and your daily reading of the scripture. The very last thing that Jesus said before he entered into, ascended into the heavens. Y'all know when a person gives you their very last thing, they're going to tell you what's the most important. So the most important thing Jesus wanted us to know is that we needed to go out to all the nations, tell them about him and make disciples.
Today I want to talk about why there is an urgency to give the gospel. And I have four really short reasons. We, I don't know what time it is, but we're probably going to get out early because this is not really deep, okay? Let's start with my first uh, verse is 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verses 10 uh, through 11. Time's going to come where I'm going to show my son how to put that up on the screen for you as well. And it reads, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, I'm going to stop there because the others talks about how Paul wants them to look at him. Paul says, The apostle warns us that everyone must appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to receive the punishment or the reward for what he has done. A lot of us think that only the wicked come before the judgment seat, but the Bible tells us everybody must appear before Jesus' judgment seat to receive either the reward or the punishment for what he's done. The only problem is Romans 3.24 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There's a little problem there. <laughs> Because if I've sinned and fallen short of God's glory, I'm really not that excited about coming before that judgment seat. Because the scripture says, I rightly deserve what I'm going to get. And because we have all sinned, our due reward is eternal damnation. But the gospel tells us if we repent and put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins will be imputed to him. And his righteousness will be imputed to us. So that when the Father sees us, he would see that as if we had never even sinned. Amen. It didn't say we didn't sin. It said he'll deal with us as if we've never even sinned. Therefore, the wrath of God, eternal death, everlasting damnation, the blazing furnace, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, that place where the worms never die, where the fires never quench, will not be the punishment to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. That's not hard. Paul knows. Paul says, knowing the fear that is in the Lord. There's some version that says, knowing the terror of the Lord. In other words, it's saying, knowing the wrath of God. But whatever you want to call it, whether fear or terror or wrath, Paul says, knowing what's going to happen to those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, we persuade them, we convince them, we postulate to them, we sway them. Paul says we don't just tell somebody about Jesus. What we have to do, we have to convince them that the way they have been living is not in line with what God wants them to live. So we should be, so we should have an urgency to tell people about the gospel because we, every one of us here, know the wrath that is in God. We know the terror that is in God. We know the outcome to those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. The second reason I have is we have a responsibility to the lost. I know nobody likes to say this, but y'all heard it says, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. <coughs> the scripture that was read earlier, I'm just gonna read up to verse uh, five. It's Ezekiel 33, one through five, I'm gonna read it says, and the word of the Lord came to me, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, son of man, Speak to the people and say to them, If you, if I bring this word upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from among you and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, the sword will come and take him away, and his blood will be upon his own head. For he has heard the sound. 
But if the watchman does not sound that trumpet, then they, then the sword will come. But I will require his blood on the watchman. In this passage, God is saying to Ezekiel, that judgment is imminent. It is a reality. It's not much different than what we just read about Paul. We all have to come before God's judgment seat. But Ezekiel gives us a better understanding of our responsibilities as Christians. God is saying, I have appointed a watchman. Y'all don't know who's a watchman. And tonight, before you go to bed and you look in your uh, bathroom mirror, that person that's looking back to you is God's appointed watchman. I have appointed a watchman. And if that watchman does not warn you, then you will die. But his blood, your blood, I will hold on his hand. The old concept was really difficult for me when I seen this. I said, what's going on? Is God saying that if I don't witness to someone, even though he's done, lived his life all wrong, all twisted up, he's done everything wrong, then when I don't tell him about Jesus, then somehow I'm the fault? Okay, here's a really tricky part. Yes, that's exactly what it says. He says, however, if the watchman does not sound the trumpet, that is, if you and I do not tell people about salvation, if you don't share the gospel with your family, if you don't share the gospel with your friends, if, if you don't tell the gospel to your neighbor, if you're not telling it to strangers, if you're not telling it to co-workers, if you are not telling the gospel to your enemies, He's saying, then judgment will come to those who have not responded to the free offer of salvation. But somehow, God is going to hold us responsible for their failure. That's kind of crazy. Y'all think I made that up? Let me tell y'all a story. And trust me, I didn't make that up. <clears throat> there was a man uh, named Dr. Um, I hope I don't mess up his name. Martin. Nine more. He was a, a German uh, pastor during the time of Adolf Hitler reign. And Dr. Mark Neymar was sent to prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before being sent to prison, Dr. Neymar had a 30 minute visit from Adolf Hitler himself. Hitler tried to persuade the doctor to join the forces and to turn from what he called the stupidity of Christianity. For 30 minutes, Hitler and Dr. Neymar discussed philosophy, discussed ideologies, discussed Nietzsche and all those other things. And in the end, Dr. Neymar says he's not gonna give up his commitment to Jesus Christ. So they threw him in prison. Years later, Dr. Neymar was raised, was released from prison. He testified he had visitors, he had visions that haunted him. At night he said he dreamed he saw Hitler standing before Jesus' judgment seat. And Jesus asked him, do you have an excuse for what you've done? Why have you done these horrible things you've done? And he says, and Hitler looked at Jesus Christ and said, nobody told me about the gospel. Dr. Neymar says he wasted 30 minutes arguing philosophy. He wasted 30 minutes arguing ideologies when he could have spent that 30 minutes telling them about Jesus. Who knows, maybe if he had given him the gospel, World War II may have came out different. Maybe 30 million people and 6 million Jews would not have died. But I think it's unfair to say that, we don't know. But I'm not sure I could live with myself knowing that 
If I had given him the gospel, maybe things could have been different. The point we need to understand is that God holds us responsible for the eternal death of those that fail to share or to re uh, respond to the gospel because we fail to share. Y'all think I made that up. I know y'all was here. Let's go to Acts. Acts chapter 20. I want to go to verse uh, 25 and say tw to 27. Paul speaking to, uh, I'm not sure which church he's speaking to right there, but he's talking about the very thing that we were just saying. Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 25 through 27. And Paul says, And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For that I did not shriek from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul knows that if you don't share the gospel, you are not innocent of their blood. That's some scary stuff. So the second reason there's an urgency to share the gospel is we constantly meet people all day long, all day long. And to those that we fail to share the gospel, the question is, will God say, I hold you responsible? His blood is on your hands. The third reason is God is compassionate. Matthew 9, 35 and 37 says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to the crowds, and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray, earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There should be an urgency in our evangelism that flows not from our love for God, but our love for the loss and the afflictions that they're going through. Sickness, disease, heart attacks, everyone but because of the situation and circumstances, everyone deals with them a little bit different. The scripture says that Jesus went throughout the cities and the villages and the synagogues, healing every form of sickness and disease. And it says when he saw the crowds of the people, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I imagine they were harassed with their sicknesses. They were harassed because of their financial situation. I imagine they were harassed emotionally and even spiritually. The scripture says, when he seen them and they were that they were harassed and helpless, unable to do anything about their situation that he had compassion for them. Hebrews 4.15 tells us we have a high priest who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. So Jesus knew what they were going through. He knew how they were suffering and he had compassion for them. Now I want to try to pay attention to what I'm saying here because this is probably the most important point of this sermon. Because Jesus had compassion for him, them, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. There are a lot of people out there going through some things right now. There are a lot of people suffering from sicknesses. 
There are a lot of people who are suffering from loneliness. There are a lot of people who are suffering from anxiety. There are a lot of people who are suffering from depression. There are a lot of people who are suffering from sickness. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the labor is a few. In Matthew 11, 28 and 30, he says, to those who are in those that ain't, who are suffering like that, he says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, and I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers in his harvest. Jesus is saying we need more people who are committed to reach people, especially those who are downtrodden, especially those who are hurting, especially those who are emotional, especially those who feel lost, especially those who, who have anxieties, with depression. Jesus is saying those are the laborers we need to reach those people and tell them to take his yoke. But his yoke is easy. There's a story I'm going to tell you about. Uh, about this uh, 11 year old boy who every Sunday after church would pass out Bible tracts with his father. His father was the pastor of the church they went to. However, on this particular Sunday afternoon, it was pouring down rain. So the pastor, his father, said to his son, I wasn't going to, I'm not going to pass out tracks today because of the rain. And the little boy looked at his father and says, Aren't people going to hell even if it rained? <laughs> the father nodded in agreement but told him, that it was okay if he go out and pass those tracks out by himself. <laughs> so the boy went to pass out tracks, just as he had done every Sunday, since he was old enough to go out with his father. <clears throat> the very next Sunday in church, an elderly woman stood up and said she wanted to share with the congregation something. She said that a week ago, her husband had died, and she didn't know how she was going to make it. In fact, she said she wanted to kill herself. She had went up into her attic, and she tied a rope around the beams, and she was standing on a chair, and she was going to put it around her neck and jump off and hang herself. But she said just as she stood up in the chair, she heard a knock at her door. And she said, well, nobody ever visits me anyway. Why would I worry about this knock at the door? Maybe if I be real quiet, they'll go away. But she said, rather than the knock going away, it got louder and louder and louder. And it kept knocking on the door. And she said, I'm ready to give this, you know, do away with myself. But I'm wondering why someone's knocking at the door and they never come. No one ever comes to my door. So she jumped down off of her chair. And she walks down the steps and she opens the door. And there she sees this little boy soaking wet, drenched in rain. And she calls him into the house and she puts towels around him to help him dry. And she gives him tea and, and tells him, what are you doing out in the rain like that? You see, the little boy had got determined to give tracks, but he didn't realize the rain was going to come down so hard. So he ran under the cover of her little aunt and hoping that it would protect him from the rain. And then when he seen lights so far off in her house, he knocked on the door, knocked on the door, believing that it was someone there. And when she opened it up and let him in and she cared for him, he reached in his pocket and pulled out a track. And on the front of the track, it had simple words. No matter what you're going through, Jesus loves you. Amen. Amen. And she said, right then, 
she realized she had to come to church. And she hadn't been to church in many, many years. And she didn't even know a church to go to. But when she turned the track over, the address of the church where that little boy had given her was on it. And she wanted to come back to that church and thank that little boy for saving her life. Praise the Lord. The scripture says we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Amen. And we should have an urgency to reach those people that may be on their way to the brink of doing something they can't undo. When all they need is to know that there's someone greater that really cares for them. Amen. My last reason is we must be faithful. There was this young man that went to a job interview. I know y'all say I tell a lot of stories. My grandkids had to tell other stories still, so don't feel bad. <laughs> there was a man that went to a job interview for at a movie theater. He wanted to be the usher. And one of the questions the interviewer asked him was, if there's a fire in the, in the, in the movie theater, what would you do? The young man thought for a minute and, and looked at the interviewer like, man, that's a stupid question. He said, don't worry, I'll make it out. <laughs> the interviewer politely thanked the man for his time. And he was never called again for that job. <laughs> In a way, many of us that claim to be Christians are just like that young man at the movie theater. When the burning fire of hell comes, we just like that young man say, because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, don't worry, I'll make it out. Completely forgetting about the people in the theater of our lives that God has put in our care. That God is expecting us to help get out of that situation. The question each and every one of us must ask ourselves as Christians every morning is, how much or how little do we value the salvation of someone else? Am I like a fireman who runs in the fire to save someone? Or am I like that usher who runs out and says, I got mine, they got to get theirs. I want y'all to go home today and think about it. When you go to heaven, will there be anybody already there that can give a testimony that they're there because of the gospel was given to them by you? The Bible says everyone that does not accept salvation through Jesus Christ will spend eternity in hell. Therefore, knowing the wrath of God, the question is, do you love someone? Is not, do you love someone enough to tell them the gospel? The question is, do you hate them so much you won't share it? That's my word. Let us stand up, please.